you dream of a classroom where learning is natural? Can we inspire students to lifelong learning? What exactly is the purpose of an education? Inspiring students to be curious, independent, creative, innovative, deep thinking, confident, proactive, collaborative, determined, educated. Rise to the challenge of changing the world. This is teaching. This is learning. This is who we are. Welcome to the Tabletop Inventing Podcast. What is the secret for great invention ideas? Where can you go to find a community to help you innovate? If you're a techie, aka geek, smarty pants, or red hot genius, where can you find your people? We'll be answering these questions on today's podcast, so keep on listening. Today's guest is Gene Sherman from Vocademy, the makerspace in Riverside, California. Gene and his tribe of makers mounted a successful crowdfunding campaign on Fundable.com and last year opened their first makerspace in Riverside, California. Gene loves to make things, and today we'll find out why he's so passionate about makerspaces. Hey, Innovation Nation, we want to recognize your excitement about the Tabletop Inventing Podcast. If you feel we've earned it, we'd love for you to leave us a five-star rating on iTunes. If you leave us a rating and a review, we'll give you a shout-out here on the podcast. If you contact us via email after leaving your feedback, you'll have a chance to get a special gift from us. Every week, we'll choose a special person to receive a $50 credit for the upcoming Inventors Bootcamp. To learn more about Inventors Bootcamp, visit www.ttinvent.com slash bootcamp. That's www.ttinvent.com slash b-o-o-t-c-a-m-p. And now, this week's shout-outs. A big thank you to EA Prof, 1PWR, Netstat Man, CJT4, Debbie K., Messy Engineer, and Angry App. Now, Angry App left us a great feedback, and I just, I can't help but read this. It says, the discussion, or non-discussion, about educating our children has become a collection of buzzwords and politicized sentences on a news site, or sound bites in the evening news. The Tabletop Inventing Podcasts don't have all the answers, like everyone else, but they are seeking them. And they do go deep and thoughtful in discussing how we can better educate our children in the context of STEM. If you care deeply about the education of your children and think often how they might learn to thrive in our future, check out the TTI podcast. Thank you so much, Angry App, for leaving us this great feedback. And now the moment you've been waiting for, the great inventor secret of the week. I know that many of you are interested in tabletop inventing because you want to learn how to become a great inventor. And so we've decided to add a little section here every week to help you understand that inventing is not a mysterious process. Inventing is actually something that most people can do. There are lots of very doable things that you can learn to become a great inventor. So here's this week's secret. The wheels in my head are always turning. I'm not sure actually how to make them stop. My mind is always chewing away on some challenge or idea. If I see a semi-truck on the highway with some sort of strange-looking titanic device, I immediately begin to reverse engineer it in my head to discover its function. When my wife says the car is making a funny sound, I can't keep myself from thinking through the possible causes. It's a real riot sometimes inside my little mental piece of the universe. However, my best ideas usually come from somewhere else. I knew it! There's an idea fairy that appears to the best inventors. (laughs) Okay, we're getting a little off the beaten track here. No, there is not an idea fairy or an exclusive club just for great inventors with the best ideas. So where do the best ideas hide? The germ of an answer can be found in a quote attributed to Frederick Beekner. He says, Vocation is where our greatest passion meets the world's greatest need. 
Even though this podcast is not necessarily about finding your vocation, we do want to help you and the young inventors in your care to find the path to meaningful innovation. That path begins at the intersection of passion and need. Why? Passion is that place of excitement, depth, resolve, fury, love, beauty. No true innovation happens without a little passion to find a solution. Passion to make it just a little better. Passion to share it with the world. There is a place described by some of the most creative minds as flow or inspiration or simply getting in the groove. To find this place, some play music, some need silence, some seek the hum of a makerspace, and others immerse themselves in new environments. Wherever this place is philosophically, you have to spend time understanding yourself well enough to know how to connect with that place where, as Arthur Gordon says, you learn to love life and it will love you right back. This may seem a little esoteric, but think about those times in your life where you felt truly inspired. Metaphorically, the clouds parted, the birds sang, and everything seemed right with the world. But seriously, for most, these moments are rare. But for some, these moments can be summoned much more frequently. If you're looking for a little inspiration, I highly recommend the little book, A Touch of Wonder, by Arthur Gordon. Throughout his little book, Gordon describes the state of mind required to touch the inspiration in life. Sometimes it's the simple sound of the ocean surf just drowning out the noise in our head. Sometimes the penetrating insights of a deeply respected friend or colleague. Here is the place where passion resides. Are you ready for the answer? Seek out the places, experiences, and people that draw out from your depths the response, that was amazing. We've all had these experiences once in a while, but great innovators seek out such experiences more often and are rewarded with fantastic inspiration. These experiences are almost always free and somewhat unexpected even while we seek them out. I actually have a little routine I call chasing the sunrise. It's my little game of hide and seek with life. Here in the high desert, we have a beautiful view of the eastern skyline and every morning like clockwork, the sun comes up and floods the world with radiant color and the world responds by adding rich texture upon which to catch the colors splashing onto the dynamic canvas of cloud and mountain and desert sand. With very few exceptions, I am inspired every single morning. For you, the wonder, amazement, and beauty in life may come from the ocean, a secluded mountain glen, watching people, or reading a great book. Whatever your muse, seek it out often. You will be rewarded regularly for your diligent search. It may be easier to complain about the person in the next cubicle, curse at the car that cut you off in traffic, or sigh in frustration about your teenager's most recent foolishness. However, negative emotion or blasé perspectives lead to poor creative outcomes. Once in a while a negative rant is funny, but more often than not it just leads us to complain a little more. Change this mental pattern. It may take time to develop a habit of seeing the best in people, the best in life, and the best in yourself. But create in your life a pattern of being inspired. Being in a mental place of excitement, beauty, and awe will produce passionate thinking, and passionate thinking will produce great innovations. And yet, there's one more piece to this puzzle. Remember, the world's great need. Indeed, the world has many challenges and needs, but there's a place in each of our lives where that need collides with our deep passion. Without the need, our passion 
may simply be a self-centered fit of excitement. But there's something deeply moving and transcendent and inspiring about meeting a need that no one else has been able to fill. It is precisely the need which defines the intrinsic value of the solution we create. Sometimes the need arises from a single individual and the solution is purpose-built for only that one. At other times we may hear the need of one individual, find a solution, and unwittingly meet the need of many. Sometimes the crushing press of the need is palpable and our solution is aimed from start to finish at literally healing the world's great need. No matter the case, a great invention always meets a need, great or small, and its success is measured against an objective standard. One of the greatest pleasures of being an inventor is being able to yell, Eureka! I found it! You can tell when a great inventor finally achieves a milestone because there's almost always an audible exclamation of, Yes! It worked! The excitement bursts forth because the invention just met spec by performing a task against an objective standard. In other words, it just met the need. So the next time you're looking for a great idea, start looking around for the world's great need. And when you see a need that stirs up the feeling of, that would be so cool, together with the internal response, I think I would really enjoy that. Take note, because the best solutions occur when our greatest passion meets the world's greatest need. And now, our featured guest. My guest today is Gene Sherman from Vocademy, and uh, I will let Gene introduce himself today. So tell us a little bit about yourself, Gene. Uh, my name is Gene Sherman, uh, I, and I'm a maker. <laughs> I've been making things my whole life, and luckily I've had the opportunity in the past couple of years to make it a reality for other people. So uh, I was born in the Soviet Union. My family emigrated here when I was seven years old. I'm an American citizen, a very proud and happy one. Uh, uh, the son of blue-collar parents, a hairdresser and a toolmaker. I was not bound for college, so I knew my path was set in the trades. I was lucky enough that my father had a shop where I learned a lot of the stuff. I even before that, I grew up making plastic models and playing with the, the Russian version of Erector sets and, and uh, found out I had a knack for creating physical objects, whether it be a uh, metal or plastic or any other material. And then uh, my career has spanned from working at a machine shop, a journeyman toolmaker without the piece of paper, from mold making to stamping and dyes to prototyping and R&D. I spent 30 years in manufacturing. And, and a lot of those 30 years uh, toward the end of that career was spent hearing from my friends and in industry, because I've visited hundreds and hundreds of companies saying that the educational system is not making the kind of people they need with the skills that they need. Uh, I went to work for a university for a number of years, thinking that I'm going to go there and, and teach these engineering students uh, the real world skills that they need. Found out I couldn't teach. I'm not a professor. They didn't have a curriculum for a shop class. That, plus hearing from my friends in industry, led me to the starting of uh, our makerspace here. And the idea here is I would have the opportunity to share my experience and along with other gray-haired types to share what they've learned in industry and teach people real skills. And I, I've been very fortunate that way. I'm a, I'm a resident of Riverside, right here where Vocademy number one is, out of hopefully hundreds. And I'm um, fortunate to be in a building full of creative people. Maybe not right now because it's a little early, but, but uh, very glad to be part of this maker movement. And uh, in a word to define me, I'm a maker and a very proud one. So. How far did you go in your educational career before you decided college wasn't on the track? High school. I got through high school. I barely got through high school. I'll be honest, I couldn't get past pre-algebra. I didn't have a knack for skills. Luckily, back then, we weren't all forced to go into college. We weren't told either college or you're a nobody. Luckily, uh, even though I didn't go to a trade school, I had the opportunity to go from, to my father's shop. I, mean, I wanted to go to uh, Art Center of Design and, and design cars and aircraft, but didn't have the money for that either. So luckily, I went to my father's shop. I was 14 when I started there, so and by the time I was 16, I was running some very impressive machines because in the mid-80s, uh, that's where computer-controlled machines were coming around, and the old-timers were used to cranking handles. I was used to pushing buttons. Computers were just coming on board. And I remember 
the first computer I had was a 286 at work. And they were afraid of the blink, blinking green cursor. I said, I'm not afraid. I, what can this, how much damage can I do? Well, you find out quickly. And I found I had a talent for, for uh, creating and using CNC machines. And uh, that led me to other job opportunities because I find out uh, I, w I was very fortunate. I saw my friends go off to college and some of them come back and not know what to do. I saw other friends that made their living in construction and, and other trades. And I see, you know, we gathered with them over the years in the desert with our motorhomes and our dune buggies thinking that this is the life. This is what we want out of life. We don't need a McMansion. We don't need to live in a cubicle 24-7 uh, uh, to pay the bills. We love what we do. I was surrounded by people who truly use their hands and their minds uh, to make a living. So I did go back to college in the early 2000s to get a uh, bachelor's in vocational education. I'll finish it someday. The idea was for me to become a real shop teacher. Then I found out shops don't exist anymore. <laughs> so, so my career ended with about half a year of college, 4.0 students so far, but happy with my high school education plus 30 years of, if you want to call it, on-the-job training. And I'm still learning every day. So what was your what was your first job out of college? Did you say your dad had a shop? Correct. My dad had a small machine shop. No, I, I worked at the gas stations. I worked at the the, the video rental stores when they had those. Um, but yeah, my father's shop. I started out being what I call the pilot. You would pilot there. You would pilot there. You would pilot <laughs> wherever they want you to pilot. Sometimes I was the gopher. You know, go for this, go for that. And then very quickly they found out that uh, I could fix things. We were assembling these giant machines, and, and here comes this 15-year-old goes, I don't think that's right. Something doesn't look right about that. And the guys would come around going, Hey, who mounted this? This is mounted wrong. You know, <laughs> Gene figured it out. So I started bandsawing parts. I spent months deburring metal oh, pieces and lovely. bandsawing. I got really good and I hated it. Um, so that's when I found out uh, I had the knack. So I started pretty much in my father's shop. And from that point forward, it, it's been in one type of manufacturing or another. Was that in aerospace or big commercial Everything. stuff? I worked for job shops. I worked for shops that just, I call them AFABs, anything for a buck. Uh, then I worked as an applications engineer, engineer in name only for a company that made electrical discharge machines, very high-tech machines like for cutting metal. For smart, oh, for they would take a wire. Okay. You'd get a spool of 10,000 diameter wire, which is about three times thicker than your hair. They would electrify that wire, and it would cut through hardened metals of all kinds using electricity as an erosion. Like a tungsten wire or something? Uh, or? No, it's copper-coated brass wire. And what would happen huh. is, so, so imagine you have this wire, literally thickness of your hair, cutting steel. And what it would do, you know what a bandsaw has teeth, mm -hmm. right? And the bandsaw bites with the teeth. Well, imagine you use a spark as a tooth. So... Thousands of times a second, a little spark would hit the metal, heat it up, cool it, uh, okay. it would blow All off right. a microscopic pellet of that material, and it would erode it. The wire would suffer the same damage, but the wire is constantly... Okay. So elect basically electron sandblasting. Basically, yes. Okay. Yes, correct. So I went to work for that company because I got really good at running those machines, and they said, you're so good, you need to go teach other people how to do it. And that's how I got to visit all these hundreds of companies. And that was about how far into your machining career before you started? Uh -huh. Five, six years. Five, six years. Yeah. And how long has it been since then, if I can ask? <laughs> yeah, I, ran, I stopped running those machines in probably 97, okay, so 1997. Wow. So it was, it was about, um, my, my life in the machine tool business was about 15 years. 15 years. Traveling from company to company, not including starting my father's shop a number of years there, and toward the end here, uh, working at, for my own little shop that I started, and then at the university. All right. And so the university was most recent before Vocademy. Correct, before starting Vocademy. That was the final straw that broke the camel's back. So what was it there at the university that, um, that just sparked this, I've got to go start something? Um, because they weren't interested in teaching engineers real hands-on skills. In the past, when a student would go to an engineering school, it was an assumption that in high school they had shop class. Because they have that engineering desire, well, no. They don't have that in, in, in high schools anymore, in middle schools anymore. So the engineers that are coming to engineering school literally have no idea about how to use a screwdriver or the difference between a, using wood versus titanium. Yeah, they have the charts. They have the theory. They have the – but, but you know, can, you, can you put a wood screw into titanium? No. But how do you know that unless you've actually done it? <laughs> so that was my dilemma. I went in there with rosy-colored glasses thinking I'm going to teach and they need to know this stuff, and they weren't interested. At the same time – I found out about the maker movement in the early and mid-2000s. Well, when, did, when did you start at UCR? I assume that's... 2007. 2007, okay. 2007. So maker movement was already happening. I had my own shop following the maker movement. I had friends always ask if I can come over. I had a little shop behind my home uh, before going to university. And they, hey, can I come over, use your tools? I said, I can't. I don't have the time to teach you. And, and more and more of the people wanted to do that. So I went to the university 
At the same time, I said, okay, my battle in the university is difficult. Let's go to school districts. And I met with some of the superintendents and they basically said, hey, Gene, you know, we have something called the A to G requirements. It's the college yeah. prep requirements. So, so A is reading, B is math. There's a, there's a year of drama, as if anyone needs a year of drama. <laughs> You're going to get that plenty in, in your life. And then the, whatever G was, I thought, well, well, how come they're not teaching hands-on skills? And the school district says, basically, it's not in the requirements. Hmm. We can't afford to put in a half a million dollars worth of shop equipment in every school. And, and it's not required. We're not going to do it. It's easier for them to fill a classroom with books and computers than it is with any kind of technology, especially, you know, industrial art stuff, which is supposedly no, no one does it anymore. Well, somebody built your home. <laughs> You know, somebody designed that product in America. Somebody has to manufacture at least the prototypes. And, and people forget we're the second largest manufacturing powerhouse in the world next to China. We still kick India's butt when it comes to making things. We've become more efficient. We just don't have the labor anymore. There's this massive skills shortage. And so all those things came together. In 2010, I decided, you know what? My future is in a place that's open to everyone to learn these skills. And, and uh, started working toward that. And so now we're sitting in... Academy a few years later, and you survived a year, and it's actually looking good. It's getting there. It's getting there. When you, when you create something so new, something out of what people expect, it takes time for people to buy into it, especially the school districts. We're not sure what to do with you. We need you badly. We, same thing with the university. We need you badly. We realize that now, but how do we work together? Where do we get the funding? Because this is a private entity. I'm not a non nonprofit. This is a business because my goal is to replicate hundreds of times all over this country. And the way I can do that most efficiently is a private business. Keep your prices as reasonable, as low as possible. Have the most efficient and effective classes. Uh, I don't have the time to teach people theory and in history. That's what schools do. I only have time to teach you what you really need to know to get a job done. So tell me a little bit about the, because uh, I know there's a couple of cool things that have happened in the last year around Academy. Tell me some of the coolest stories, uh, maybe about the people that are here and about people that have helped make it possible. Oh, wow. Where, where do I start? So, so this did not come out of uh, some, some massive investment. There was no multi-million dollar deal here. I call it, the first thing was the taking out from the bank of understanding wife. In other words, <laughs> she said, okay, Gene, go ahead and quit your good paying job I, at the university. I have, I have, I have a, a bank like that. <laughs> so, so, number one, a withdrawal from there. And I'm still taking, <laughs> taking withdrawals out of that. Just having her understand, my family understand that this is our life. I, I'm, I'm deployed. I'm off to war. And if I win the war, our family is set for life and we win the battle and there's, you know, peace and hands-on skills for everyone. <laughs> so then we did a crowdfunding campaign. We wanted to raise $40,000. We raised 60. In this building is every piece of equipment I've ever owned and stuff that's been donated and some partner equipment from, from uh, manufacturers of tooling and equipment that believe in what we're doing. Well, behind mm -hmm. us are a couple of uh, nice CNC mills and lathes from yeah, a company admiring them a few from, ago. from Southwestern Industries. They're prototrack machines, the best, perfect machines for this environment. Let's just say they're on board with me forever. No matter how many vocademies there will be, it will be their equipment because they believe in what they're doing and they realize that I'm making users of their product. You know, I'm, I'm creating future owners, future operators, and the engineers that are familiar with their brand. So when they go off to work somewhere and the boss says, hey, we need to buy machines, I have a suggestion. I learned this one machine. It was fantastic. So there's great benefit to them. Um, so I've had great buy-in from manufacturers. We're still working on, on others. Uh, we're about 80% full in this building as far as equipment. There's a few things on my wish list. We still have to go. Uh, so, so as far as what's happened, we opened in October of 2013, so 13 months ago. Uh, a month later luck or fate or hard work, a congressman toured our place. And, and that was phenomenal. He'd never heard of maker spaces. He'd never heard of the maker movement. Hmm. Well, let's just say we had a little bit of an influence on him. And, and I admit his um, senior advisor was all into it. He believed it. He says, Congressman, you need to be involved with the maker movement. So fast forward to February. This is November. Fast forward to February. He starts with three other Congress people, the Congressional Maker Caucus. The goal of this bipartisan caucus is to push the maker movement because they see the effects it would have on the, on the, the skills gap, because that's their concern. It's jobs, 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 economy, economy, economy. So they started that maker caucus. Around the same time, and, and we can back up to maker fairs. Maker fairs are becoming huge in this country. Well, the White House decides to have their own maker fair, the first White House maker fair. And I thought, I don't have a chance of being invited. Who am I? It's 100 people only. And, but then I found out when the people in the White House said, who should we invite? The congressman's people said, we have a guy for you. So I got invited to the, the White House Maker Fair. Holy crap. And they said, well, well why, why invite me? Because they like your business model. Their problem is this skills gap. They know how slowly schools 
and ac academics institutions move. They know that trade schools have an image issue. You're making makers, which is exactly what this country needs because this country was founded on makers. We have our founding fathers, each one of whom was a maker, owned, owned a farm, created products, you know, Franklin, all those guys. Yeah. So uh, then we go on to the Wright brothers, Harley Davidson, uh, Hewlett and Packard, Steve and Steve from Apple. So they realize that, wow, here's a movement that's making makers, but, but are they really teaching them? Well, us being the first education-focused makerspace, the White House said, you know what, let's invite them because their business model does make sense. They're teaching. They're doing the things that maybe schools will bring back someday. Until then, let's, so I got there. No one handed me the million-dollar check. You know, no government. He said, oh, this is what. I met some amazing people, and that was in June. I, I got to the White House. Um, and that's had a tremendous effect on us as far as our credibility and for what we're doing. And then it's been a little surprise after a little surprise. We're, we're finding out that we're changing people's lives here. For some people, the socially awkward, awkward, brilliant people are makers. They don't go to nightclubs. They don't go to baseball games. They don't watch football. They like to create and tinker. Now they find out that there's a place they can do it together. And it's awesome. <laughs> we, have, we have high school kids that don't know what quite to do. And they go, well, I... I like to make things, so they go through our machine shop class. And they go, I have a set of skills I can offer the world now. No accreditation, just a piece of paper that says, I finished this class. And when they go to their employees, the employer goes, oh, show me. Nice piece of paper, show me, and they show them, and that's the proof we have. Engineering students starting to come here, realizing that we are the unfair advantage for them. They realize that I'm going to have this diploma after I'm done with school. I don't have anything else. Now I'm going to have this portfolio, this maker portfolio. And MIT, as of this year, has started accepting maker portfolios. So it's a genuine thing. So in other words, MIT used to be just grades. We'll take the 4.0s, the top of the cream of the crop, and they're realizing that this cream of the crop is all academic. We need engineers with hands-on skills. So now they say, your grades are important, but show us what you've made. And they're starting to accept it. So it's happening. It's really happening to justify our beliefs that we've had here. Um, it was amazing. My f the first woodshop class in here it was a 17-year-old boy who was the youngest, and a 64-year-old woman was the oldest. Wow. Where else does that happen? The other night, we had, we had a young lady uh, laser-cutting pieces for her wedding dress, or someone's wedding dress. <laughs> and it was a wedding dress in our laser cutter. <laughs> that was awesome. And there's the, the nerd standing around going, you know, if we put some EL wire in there, we can light that dress up when you're on the dance floor on your wedding day. Like, Holy crap. Where <laughs> does a someone who's interested in sewing have access to a laser machine and the people standing around going, you know, we can light that up. You know, put some low voltage wire in there, make your dress blue and react to the music. I mean, that's, that's awesome. That's, that's how things are created. I hope someone runs with that idea and, and makes uh, light up wedding dresses. Because can you imagine your father, daughter dance, the lights dim, and you light up the room with your own dress. So Actually, it's that, like, that sounds like Maker Fair. Yes, uh, that's exactly Like it. your own personal Maker Fair. That's exactly it. And which we did. We had our own Maker Fair here at uh, the beginning of October. We had 1,300 people show up in our parking lots because we couldn't fit them in the building. Wow. And it was, it was a phenomenal day. 1,300 people with only like two months' notice. How many, how many people from the community, like businesses and other organizations that showed up with booths and things? We had 70 vendors. 70. 70. From the Bomb Squad to the 501st Legion. The, the Bomb Squad. The Riverside City Bomb Squad. Because? Because they want to get kids interested in building robots. Cool. And, and they're telling kids like, yeah, this robot is a thousand pieces. Someone had to make each and every piece. And they're going, oh, so I need to start learning how to make stuff. So it was fantastic. So we had a bunch of robotics teams. So it's kind of like, here's your basic five-year-old robotics. And down the lane, we had at the end the robotics team saying, hey, you want to join the sheriff's department? We need people who know how to fix these. To show people that, look, there's the end result of you learning about robotics. Uh, we had the 501st Legion, which are the people that dress up in Star Wars clothing. Mm. We had pe some people bring out their inventions. Some people bring out their electronics devices that they were selling. Um, we had something called a nerdy derby set up, which is like a pine, pine wood derby thing, but it was the world's tallest, longest pine wood derby with a giant mm, <laughs> roller coaster type feature to it. We had 3Rs Robotics comes out, which is a company that's making very cool hands-on educational kits. Um, we had some other makerspaces show up because we're a community fighting for the same thing, to give people access to these tools. Um, we built our own human foosball rink, which was, uh, if you've ever played foosball, the table foosball, well, we had a 20 by 40 uh, plywood boxed area with the pipe slider so humans would hold onto the pipe and act like... Uh, foosball players. It, it was phenomenal. We had the, the local live steamers, which is a, a bunch of old guys that build these massive steam cars, uh, trains oh, wow. that you can ride on. We brought them over. They were showing them off to people. So it was, 
We had the Batmobile here. We had an airplane in our parking lot. A flight school said, hey, can we come and teach people about flying? Sure, as long as you bring a, uh, bring a, frame, um, a plane and explain to people how planes work. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. It's always, it's been, it's been a crazy, crazy day. I, I don't remember much of it, but it was phenomenal. So um, we're slowly growing. We're making relationships with school districts. Now they're calling us. We're working on grants with the university to send engineering students here. We're open to the community. So that's one thing that will always be the case. No matter where Vocademy goes, it will always be a maker space at heart. Anyone can come in off the street and, and, and become a maker. And now, normally we're 14 years old and up. Now we're starting programs for as young as eight and up. Get kids into crafting, get kids into Legos, get kids into reduce, reuse, recycle. We're using up the resources of this world really quick. We better teach them how to recycle. <laughs> we better get that ingrained in them. You don't throw that bottle away. You make string out of it and use it for something else. So, yeah, oh, it's, it's been a crazy ride. So let me shift gears on you a little bit. Sure. Um, so we're interested in the educational aspects mm -hmm. of... Uh, the maker movement, and uh, you and I have certainly had lots of conversations about this. In today's environment, you can hop on a computer, you can type in something sure. on, in Google or Wikipedia or Bing or you know some other information site, and you can make yourself look like you're 20 IQ points smarter. Correct. What does it mean to be educated in, in an environment where that happens, where that's a possibility? Like I tell my kids, it's not about who you work for. It's not about your education. It's about me incorporated. It's your personal skill set. It's not what someone taught you. It's what you're able to learn. Um, let, let, let me back up. The common term is how intelligent are you, which I don't like. The right way to say it is how are you intelligent. So yes, you, you can go on a computer and learn a lot. But when it comes to hands-on skills, you need another human being to show you. Plus, you need those tools and that equipment. Schools are doing a great job of, well, okay, let me back up. Schools are doing an okay job of pumping people full of information that everyone else knows. How do you separate yourself? How do you learn other things? How do you learn to be a thinker? Because schools just fill you with data. They just fill you with data they hope you retain at test time or on your college entrance exam. Whereas in the maker movement, it's, it's more of a journey of discovery. Find what you want to know. Learn what you want to learn. And here are the resources to help you do it. Yeah. Yeah. So tell me a couple of stories about people that you know maybe that have come through here, people that influenced you to create this environment that became remarkable because they discovered who they were or they discovered through the process of tinkering. Sure, sure. Well, we had a so 17-year-old kid uh, not doing well in, in school, some, some sort of special issues. Um, parents didn't know what to do with them, sat all day play video games on the computer, they bought him a membership. They bought him a bunch of class hours. And he said, go go find your thing. Go go figure out what you like to do. Well, he, he kind of liked woodshop. Started taking our woodshop classes. Started making bowls. Started making boxes. Started making stuff out of wood. And the, the parents told me, the amazing thing is when, after a little while, he started making gifts for his family. This is a child that I was always taking the resources of the family, always needing, always taking in, finally giving back. How good did that make him feel? How good did it make the family feel? He says, here, I spent hours working on this. I want you to have it. You mean so much to me. For the first time, that child is giving back. Not only that, he's starting to sell some of his stuff on Etsy. Little, little cool wooden bowls on Etsy that he made himself, and he's learning more and more and more. And, and that's stuff like that. Stuff like that just blows me away. We have... We have a guy here that works as a graphic artist during the day and comes here at night making these beautiful props and sells those props, and that pays for his membership here. <laughs> That's awesome. He, he, he's doing what he loves. So his job pays the bills, and he comes here to do what he loves. We have, um, I don't want to use names, but, but we have uh, a young lady that, that joined us recently and, and uh, come to find out from a family member that she was a bit of an introvert, didn't go out, and has blossomed here. He, seeing the amazing transformation in her house, she's... She's uh, talking to people, interacting, having a great time, learning great skills. And, and it's amazing. You don't think that all I'm doing is giving you some access to tools. And, but makers, I mean, it, it's an amazing thing. Makers are good people. I've never met an evil maker. You know, there's no, there's no, uh, uh, you know an evil mad scientist isn't here yet. So we are, we are changing lives, and we're going to do it over and over again. So you're a place for those type of people to find their people. Absolutely. For people to be comfortable, 
for people to realize that others oh, people like me. I, I met a kid uh, at the, a career day and he goes, yeah, my friends always make fun of me because I like to take stuff apart and you know, glue it together and make weird things. And he's all, I'm like, welcome. Welcome to your tribe. <laughs> welcome to your home. You're, you're not weird. You're awesome. You're a standout. Here's what's different in the world. This is what the world needs. And he's like, really? There's people like me? I said, yes. And, and it's funny that that's what education tends to forget that we're trying to make individuals. We're not trying to make everyone conform. We want them to think differently. And, and it happens little by little. Even, even uh, Ray, the, the gentleman that helped us set up for today, he's, he's, he's a staffer. And uh, he probably couldn't get a job somewhere else. And we love him here. You know, because he does a great job of, of keeping the place looking good and fixing things. And, and so, so it goes beyond just the members. It, it goes to our staff. You know, we're, we're a startup company. We pay, not great, just a little bit above minimum wage. But by working here, you have access to these people, to these resources, to these classes. Because we want, we want our staff to go through our own training so become, they can become better staff. So it's a huge benefit to them, too. And so there's no shortage of people that want to work here. We're working on industry relationships to get companies to send their people here for all those benefits. We want to be a gym membership for a big company. You know, gym, companies send you to gyms to become healthier because they know it's better for them. Send them here so they become smarter and it's better <laughs> for you. So let me, let me wrap up with uh, our key question that we always ask. So you painted a big picture about the maker movement and uh, the tribe of people that is associated with the maker movement mm -hmm. and a lot of the help that you've had as you built uh, an infrastructure here in the Inland Empire for people to come and be a part of that. Looking over that landscape with what you've said so far, what is the purpose of an education in your opinion? To help people find their purpose in life, to help people find their cause, their goal, their skills. And I used to say, find your passion. Look, I want to be a race car driver and a helicopter pilot. That's, that's my passion. <laughs> I want to help people find their skill. And if they love what they do, it's no longer work. So I think schools need to help students find their skill, not tell them what their skill is, not try to develop the skills they think is necessary, help them find their skills. If you're not mathematically strong, but you're uh, kinesthetically or uh, tactilely strong, you should be learning this. You can't judge a fish on its ability to climb a tree. All right, so stop trying to force fish up the tree. That's what they should do. Uh, Germany, for example. Choose at a young age. You want to go more the academic route? You want to go more the vocational route? Pick. Pick what you want to learn at a young age. And if you find out later on it's not your thing, you can switch over. There's no, that's it. You've chosen. So let's learn from those other schools. Let's learn from those other countries because we don't have it figured out yet. Um, and stop forcing all kids to learn the same thing. Stop. It's just, it doesn't work. We're, we always value individual, individualism in this country, but we still try to make clones stamp out in the system like uh, sir ken robinson is in his amazing ted talks yeah. you know we're, we should not think of education as a as a uh manufacturing company pumping out clones duplicates we should be a free thought community and inspire kids of all ages to to find their thing education should help people find their skill their mission in life Excellent. Well, thank you, Gene. I appreciate you taking a few My minutes. Pleasure. Uh, this will not be the last time. Uh, thank you so much for thank you so much for creating a community like this near me, so I can come play. <laughs> I found I found my people. <laughs> Absolutely. Glad thank to you, have Gene. you part of the tribe. But, but the one thing I want to point out about the tribe, mm -hmm. it's not it's it's not exclusionary. Everyone's a maker. Makers are self-selecting. I've met plenty of people. Who goes ah, that doesn't interest me. Okay, you're not a part of the tribe. It's not like we kicked you out. If you're a maker, welcome. What do you make? I make fine art. I make jewelry. I make cars. I make plastic toys, you're welcome into the tribe. So if you self-label as a maker or a desire to be one, you're in. You're in the club. Here's the secret handshake. You know? Excellent. Well, thank you for inviting us into the tribe. My pleasure. Have you been enjoying the Tabletop Inventing podcast? Have comments or questions you'd like us to address? Contact us, and we'll think through the comments and answer your questions here in the podcast. And be sure to let us know if you'd like a shout-out or to remain anonymous. You can share your comments and questions at www.ttinvent.com slash podcast or by emailing us at podcast at ttinvent.com. Let's discuss your thoughts and questions. Join us again next time when we will again seek to answer the question, what is the purpose of an education? And as educators, how do we awaken the inventor 
in each of our students.